Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Rula Assad. I am journalist, the executive director of Syrian Female Journalist Network. Today, our discussion will focus on the topic of the, the search for Syrian 100,000 de detained and exclusive in new film screening and webinar afterwards for upcoming two hours. I'm delighted to introduce to you our panelists for, to, for today, uh, starting with Noura Ghazi Safadi, a Syrian human rights lawyer and activist. Noura was one of the founder of Families for Freedom, a Syrian woman-led uh, advocacy group for detainees and their relatives. We also have my dear friend Amir Matar, who is a filmmaker, lives in Berlin, where um, he fled after he was twice detained by the regime. On August 13, 2013, uh, his younger brother, Mohammed Noor, was kidnapped by ISIS. We also have um, the director, Yasmin Fadda, uh, awarded winner, uh, winning director of the film Ayuni. Yasmin also lecturer and lecturer in the film practice at Queen Mary University, um, is co-founder and a programmer of Highlights Arts and is part of a production company, Black League Film. Um, now, just a few little housekeeping before we get started. I have to say this uh, event is co-host with the Syria campaign and uh, our uni film. Um, this event will also be held on the record. Uh, please do engage. Please write your question in the Q&A um, while and through the event. At the end, we have some time to, to take some question and to answer. Uh, please don't raise hand or write on the chat, only on the Q&A uh, uh, window. Uh, we also have translation, but also it is Kinan will be translating Amir when he speaks in Arabic. And here's something about translation. We have two channels. Um, everyone, please choose English. Portuguese is actually a label for Arabic since Zoom doesn't have an Arabic label, so it's only because uh, it's only for Amir. So everyone, please choose English and keep on that channel. Um, now, I think without further ado, let's uh, before going and watch together the tra trailer, which is two uh, and a half minutes. I would love to give also a very very short uh, intro to the uh, uh, the, the sh short clip, which is filmed over six uh, years and across multiple countries in search of answers. Uh, Ayuni follows Nura and Machi as they are trying to find loved ones, um, Basil Safadi Alayhamo and Paolo Del Giulio, uh, who are among the other over 100,000 people detained by Syrian regime, ISIS, and other group in Syria. So now we are going to watch uh, the trail together. And afterwards, I will leave the floor for you, Yasmin. Thank you. And I understand you got married while he was still in prison, is that right? Yes, yep. we got married, uh, we made the marriage contract on uh, January 7, mm -hmm. 2013. Yep. And they call us uh, the bride and the groom of the Syrian revolution. <laughs> There are at least five people of our network who are killed. What do you think about your own safety? Um, I'm, I'm pretty safe. Right? You upload all this material, you get it out to the world. <laughs> اخذ موقف موقف ضدنا ابونا باولو للسيدين ابونا باولو شخصي يعني يعني يضر Personalmente, ma non solo io, vogliamo assumerci il rischio della speranza. 
I didn't see the body. I didn't see document. I didn't see anything, any evidence. Do you think you ever will? I have to. I will keep going on to have his body and all the information about his death, uh, the way, the date, all the thing. I have to, be, all the people, all the Syrians have to. This is a humanitarian right. So I have to face this disaster. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And I'd just like to say thanks to the Syria campaign for hosting this webinar. It's a real honor for me to share a platform with Nora and Amr and Willa. Um, so as you guessed, I'm the filmmaker of the film Ayuni, and um, I've made films, several films in and on Syria over the years. It's a place that's very close to my heart, um, but I think Syria matters not only for Syrians, but for all of us. And making films is a way for me to share that with audiences around the world. So some background to this film. This actually started as a film about Father Paolo Dall'Olio. Um, he's an Italian Jesuit priest who lived in Syria for over 30 years. He set up a monastery uh, about an hour and a half from Damascus that focused on interfaith dialogue. And I'd made several films with him in his community in the past. When the revolution and uprising started in 2011, he became very outspoken and this eventually led to his expulsion from the country. And that, rather than making him slow down, actually spurred him to be even more active. Um, he used his time to really speak and reach out to many people from diplomats, grassroots groups, village councils, and liberated areas of Syria. And he even uh, took his belief in dialogue to the max and set up a TV talk show where he brought together different groups of Syrians to discuss different issues from perhaps what sectarianism, sectarianism means, the use of arms, uh, the role of the media and the press. I found this really interesting, so I reached out to him to make a new film. And so we met in Paris in 2013 when he's promoting his new book uh, titled A Priest in the Syrian Revolution. We met and then a couple of months later, he smuggled himself into Raqqa in northern Syria to negotiate the release of kidnapped journalists. At the time, Raqqa was liberated from regime forces um, and was not under total control of Daesh or ISIS at the time. So it was in a fragile moment. Uh, but Paolo tried to go and do this. And after his meeting there, he hasn't been heard from since. Um, in fact, next week is the seven year anniversary of his disappearance. It was a very shocking time, a very saddening time, a very angering time. And I didn't really know how to continue with this. Should I make a film? How do I make it? Is it safe? And this led me on a journey to understand the situation of forcible disappearance emotionally and filmically. On the way, I met so many people who told me that they knew someone who'd been forcibly disappeared. And I realized these weren't isolated incidents. This was actually being used as a weapon of war. Forcible disappearance is a human rights crime, and it violates international law, but it's one that's quite unique. The reason it's unique is it makes um, its victims disappear, it makes them invisible, and it makes them unseen. But it also puts the families of those forcibly disappeared in an emotional and informational limbo. Should they grieve or should they hope and wait? They live with so much uncertainty. They wonder how to juggle these conflicting emotions while also wanting answers, whatever those answers might be. This crime is a really cruel tactic. It affects whole communities and networks of people in Syria and beyond. The majority of these disappearances were and still are being done by Syrian government forces. This is a system that has a large bureaucracy with a network of prisons, courts, and decisions, which mostly were not privy to. Other people like Paolo are forcibly disappeared by non-state armed groups, in his case, Daesh or ISIS. Um, whether through kidnapping or detention. So while these actors are maybe different in the way they operate and run their operations, um, for the families and loved ones, the emotional realities are similar and they still need answers. So I found myself making a film about this really hard to explain situation. And I needed to find a way to convey this absence to a wider public. This was both a filmmaking challenge about how to give visibility to invisibility. I also personally knew the people who disappeared in the film, and I wanted to find a way to convey this um, disappearance and detention in a personal way. So I followed the stories and I filmed over a period of six years in many countries from Iraq to Germany and the UK, which also shows that this is an internationally connected issue. I first met Noura Ghazi Safadi, human rights lawyer and wife of Basil Safadi through friends. 
Basil was a well-known hacker and open source uh, developer, and he'd worked with uh, Mozilla and Firefox, and he'd set up Creative Commons in Syria. I'd followed his story over several years through the Free Basil campaign, which his friends around the world had set up to support him and keep his story alive when he was in detention. This was a beautiful, creative, and playful campaign that connected people together around the world. Basil was actually arrested in 2012, and he was disappeared for a few months, then eventually moved to Adra civilian prison. That's finally where Nora and his family could visit him. He was there until 2015, when he was taken from his cell and forcibly disappeared. It was after this point that I had connected with Nora. She opened up her story and her life to me, and I ended up filming with her over several years. This long period allowed me to tell a deeper emotional story about forcible disappearance and its effect over years. This isn't something that goes away, but it evolves with time. I also was in a position where I had access to archive materials. These were my own, for example, from Paolo that I'd filmed from 2004 onwards, to those filmed by Basil and Nora and their friends. These moments, these shards of film about people, especially those who'd been disappeared, makes you feel like you're working with memories. But at the same time, it allowed me to tell their stories, particularly Paolo and Basil's, in their own words, in a kind of present tense that you kind of create in a film. This film is driven by Nora and Paula's sister, Maki, as they search for answers and find solidarity with others. The word Ayuni in Arabic literally means my eyes, but it's also a term of endearment, meaning my love. Nora and Maki opened the door for me to tell a story about love between siblings and a young couple, because it's the relationships in our lives that matter the most. And I believe this is why sh what shows us why forcible disappearance is such a cruel crime. But like I said, this isn't just a Syrian issue. It has international reach and resonance. And so for this reason, we've released the film online. And for anyone not here today, you can access it directly through the film's website. And we've translated it into seven languages, including Russian and German, that are key to the international discussions relating to Syria. So to take you on this journey of the film, we're actually going to show you a couple of clips. Um, and then we're going to open up the conversation with myself and Nora and Hammer. I'm going to now show you a clip um, to introduce you to Nora. Nora is a human rights lawyer and one of the main protagonists in the film. She drives the film's emotional arc, and as, as, as I said, I filmed with her over several years. This clip actually shows um, the relationship between Basil and Nora Safadi, um, and Basil Safadi, sorry. It's made up of footage filmed by their friends, and when I originally saw this material, I could feel the emotion and intimacy in it. And it unlocked the possibility for me to tell this through an emotional, these stories of disappearance in an intimate way. Most importantly, this material like this um, gave me the chance to make visible and present the people who've been forcibly disappeared in their own voices. So yeah, if you just wait a couple of seconds, we'll show this clip and then I'll introduce you to Nora. Thank you. مثل ما عرفنا انه انتم بدكم تنخطوا هلا بهي الايام الاستثنائيه يعني فينا نقول عنها عظيمه شو شعوركم او ليش قررتوا انه تعملوا هيك خطوه؟ كانت لانه كثير بنحب بعض وكثير مناسبين لبعض وكثير بدنا نعيش مع بعض نحن تعرفنا على بعض دوم حصار كنا مقاصرين سوا بنفس البيت تعرفنا بعض اول ما شفنا بعض ما طقنا بعض انا ما طقته بس لا انا كمان ما طقته انا كثير ما طقته كثير اخذت عنه فكره غلط بس طلع بالعكس عندكم ايمان انه رح نقدر نحقق الاتجاهات بقيم دولة مدنية بتغيير هذا الواقع يعني نحن اوريدي قطعنا الشوط الاكبر بالعراقي غير فترة كثير قصيرة 
حتى نوصل لهون فيني اسالكم عن شعور الخوف في هي الايام شو بيعني الكون؟ في خوف وشو طبيعته؟ ايه انا انا كثير بخاف عليه كثير كثير هلا كنت عم بحكي لنا هذا الحدث كثير عندي وساوس مخيفه قبل ما نكون نحن بعلاقه مع بعض ما كان ما كان عندي اي شعور بالخوف بس هلا هيك صار في خوف على علاقتنا اكثر من خوف على حالنا كافراد يعني أنا المقدم باسل الصفدي وهي هويتي على فكرة الموبايل أكثر شيء بيثبت شخصيتي حاليا أعلن أني بحب نورا غازي بسبب صفاتها من أخلاق وحنان ومنعومة وأني بعد هذا اليوم لن أصبح لن أخونها بعد اليوم بعد هذه اللحظة بعد بكرة وبسبب ممارسات الأمن القمعية ونظام الأسد الفاشي تعرفت على نورا غازي بس أنا يعني قبل ما أصير عروس شعري مزيت فتلت بالسوق كتير فأش عيس مش ريسو مو لاني وسخه لاني ماشي كثير بلد وسخه والله ما في حدا Hello again. Um, so I'd just like to introduce you to Nora. Um, Nora is a human rights lawyer from Syria who worked for many years supporting political prisoners. She was one of the founding members of Families for Freedom, the Syrian women-led movement that advocates campaigns and focuses on issues of detainment and forced disappearances in Syria, which in the trailer you see one of their campaigns, which is this um, kind of London bus with images of those that are disappeared. Nora also set up No Photo Zone, a non-governmental organization that seeks to promote legal awareness, human rights knowledge, and related cases of detention and enforced disappearances. So please, Nora, take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And um, thank you for the Syria campaign for organizing this uh, great webinar. And it's always a pleasure for, to be with Yasmin, uh, Amir, and uh, Amrula. Uh, sorry, but I am moved with uh, with Yasmin's words and the trailer and the clip. Um, so just excuse me if I was a bit uh, troubled. Um, when I was hearing uh, what Yasmin ha uh, has said, and uh, at the same time I was looking at uh, Hammer face and just remember how I used to visit Hammer in in prison and uh, remember how I met Yasmin uh, at the first time um, she was pregnant with, with Zuzu. Um, actually, a kind of like all my past just passed in, in front of my eyes. I remember my childhood as I was so inspired by animals and I, I just wanted to fight everyone who hurt uh, animals and then uh, I grew up a bit and I found out that there is another kind of violations in this humanity 
which is in Africa, for example, by the racism against African. And um, when I was a child, I, I remember that I decided to get married of an African man. I thought that this is the only way that we can fight the racism. A bit after my father get detained for uh, for his ninth, uh, ninth and last time, and I was just in in very uh, like young age. I was informed and like my 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 mind was full of these thoughts about how to resist the dictatorship and how to to have your own principle and to fight until death to to defend your principle. I used to visit my, my father in the same prison that held Amir and, and Basel and other friends. I was looking at the video of my engagement party and I remember that we, we did this engagement party so like so small party with just the family because we were waiting Amir and other friends to get released until, until then we can make this, this party. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Basel, as you you may know, uh, get arrested two weeks before our wedding parties. Despite all of this, and after ten months of this deprivation of my loved one, I I I could marry him in in another prison, um, and I I really enjoyed visiting him in this prison. I love this prison, uh, even all of my hatred to, to this prison and because basically he, this prison held all the men in my life. After three years of visiting him regularly, Basel disappeared again in 2015 and I was informed in 2017 that he was sentenced to death. In 2018, I knew the date of his death after fighting for one year to know the at least the dates, and now I'm still fighting to know about all the like the facts of his execution, the burial location, and to get his remains. I am a sample of like tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of Syrian. Now I am in Lebanon. I left Syria like most of more of two years ago, and I I am so pleased that and honored that I am co-founder in the movement of Families for Freedom. That was the first uh, family association led by women that defend and advocates for the rights of detainees and infants disappeared in Syria. Two years ago, I established No Photo Zone on the legacy of Basel. No Photo Zone is providing legal assistance, legal empowerment, and advocacy for the families of missing persons, infants disappeared, and detainees. I spent almost 22 years in my life visiting after a prison, and I've been until now working as a human rights lawyer in the field of arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance for almost 16 years. I was seeing like all the changes in this in this issue and all the violation against um, basically men and women and children in in the detention centers of Syrian regime and other party parties in the conflict. Um, what I want to say is, like, uh, we are like we are women who who fight for for the rights of our male beloved ones, and the direct victims of this violation is is are men actually, and I'm I, I don't like to to call them victims because most of them um, like went to prison because of their of like a cause that they defend this cause and for their struggle against the dictatorship and other kinds of um, extremism in, in Syria. I always say that we need to urge uh, the international actors and above all of them, Russia and America, to find a comprehensive and fair solution for all the detainees and enforced disappeared in Syria that held by the Syrian authority and uh, the other party uh, parties in the conflict. These kind of violations are the most hardest uh, violation in Syria because we still live in this uncertainty and denial all the time because we don't have any kind of like 
direct information, direct access to detention centers, direct access to information about the death, uh, death facts and reasons and the border location, as I said. I work with like hundreds of families in, in many areas in, in Lebanon and now we are managing to work in Turkey as well. And we urge these families to advocate their rights and their loved ones' rights. Basically, their uh, enforced security and detainees. We urge them to be in direct contact and to register with ICRC and with ICNP. In this so embarrassing period in our life and uh, in our country life, we need to document as much as we can all this violation and to report the names uh, in order to trace uh, them in the future by the main organizations internationally and, and locally. I urge the women that I work with to, to speak out and to talk about their loved ones and to talk about their suffering and their needs. This is very important because maybe we are, let me talk about myself, maybe I was the luckiest one uh, regarding to, to have like a detainee and disappeared husband and then a dead husband, but the others uh, unfortunately have, like they, they didn't have this opportunity to be well known and uh, to be under the light as uh, for their stories to be, to be known. So people like us have to spoke on behalf of those families and also to urge those families to talk about. Um, uh, I want to conclude by thanking uh, Yasmin uh, about this great work. Actually, I've been filmed in like tens of films, but this film is like the favorite one of me for, for many reasons. One of them that Yasmin uh, emotionally and the human, humanity, humanitarian, uh, she, she was and still perfect. And we, uh, I'm so happy that we became uh, so close friends. Thank you again for everyone, and I'm, I'm happy for any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora, and uh, thank you for the kind words. Um, I'd like now to introduce you to a clip uh, with Amr Matar. So Amr, um, it shows him, so in the film, uh, there's a story of Father Paolo Dall'Olio and his disappearance, and his sister who's trying to get answers and try to understand what's happened to him. In that journey of hers, she um, meets Amr, uh, whose brother was also unfortunately forcibly disappeared in Raqqa in the same period of time. Um, so Amr and the sisters meet, uh, essentially, in the film, uh, but they're still searching uh, while this is going on. So if you could see this clip, and then I'll introduce you to Amr afterwards. Thank you. Hi, Did you was surprised when uh, you you know that uh, Paolo was kidnapped? فاجأت إنه إنه ليه تفاجأت وقت وقت كان بالرقة إنه ليش راح الرقة لأنه يعني صرنا نحس وقتها بخطر هائل إنه ليش نحنا يعني مع داعش خطف بيها باولو ب بالرقة كانت هي يعني لحظة هزة بالمجتمع لأنه كان هو ضيف وما كان يعني كان الناس يعني إجوا صحفيين خطفوا بس بالنسبة للأب باولو كان في شيء إحساس فعلا إنه هو إنه هو ضيف المدينة فالناس حسوا بتأنيب ضمير هائل ما قدروا يدافعوا او ما قدروا يستعيدوا انا رحت على السجن اللي يفترض يكون مسجون في باولو ومحمد نور اللي هو سجن السد ما في ولا اسم على الحيطان ولا ورقه بالمكان فما بعرف انا واثق اذا اذا بيصير في جهد حقيقي انا واثق 100% راح نلاقي شيء عن المختطفين أو أقلها راح نلاقي جثثهم بالمقابر الجماعية
في الوقت هو دائما ببالي وقت نحن عم ندور عن وقت عم ندور عن اخي محمد نور How old is your brother? 24 Hello. Um, I, I just want to say a note about when we filmed this scene, it really touched me because I really understood how difficult it is to get information and evidence, to gather the evidence. Um, and that meeting with Amr really brought that home. Um, I'd also now like to introduce you to Amr Matar. I also met Amr initially through film, not this film, but we worked together. He invited me to work with him on a film workshop uh, run by the Sierra Mobile Film Festival. Um, he's also a filmmaker and currently lives in Berlin, where he fled to after he was twice detained by the regime. Um, on August 13, 2013, his younger brother, Mohammed Noor, was kidnapped by ISIS. For years, his family have struggled to find out what happened to their son. Um, when ISIS was still in control of Raqqa, the main former Syrian bastion, mother, his mother, Amr's mother, was one among the women who held protests in front of their headquarters demanding answers. Um, I'd also like to say that if anyone has any questions, please feel free to start adding them into the chat so that we can open up uh, the floor soon. So yeah, please, Amr, um, I'd like to introduce you now. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Yasmin. It was very moving for me to see this scene. Thank you, Noura, for the words that you said. Nora was one of the lawyers who defended me when I was in prison. And Basid was a close friend of mine. And I never imagined that after many years from that day that each one of us would be speaking about the people in their life. that each one of us would be talking now about someone who is very important to them in their life. Or a brother who is now missing. When I was in prison in 2011, I never thought I would I never thought that the people that were outside would be now missing in prisons. When I was in prison, I sent many letters to my friends, including to Rula and Nora. It's a crazy world that we live in. I want to talk about when Father Paolo's siblings came and visited me. It happened in the context of my search for my brother, Muhammad Noor. He was my little brother. He was arrested the first time by Daesh when he was recording outside of the headquarters of Daesh. Days later, he was released. And Muhammad Noor participated in a lot of protests. 
and talked about the human rights violations and what was happening in the city during the occupation of ISIS. Then they came and they took him away in a very painful method. That was something that changed my life and my family's life. I was living in Munich then uh, in 2013. I went to visit my family, my aunts and uncles. And my aunt opened the door and she thought I was uh, Muhammad Noor and she screamed thinking that I was him. But we were asking around in all the prisons that Muhammad could have been arrested in. The families ask everyone that might have any information. ISIS threatened my family. There were many people who tried to extort us. Uh, and and tell us that they had information and they just wanted money to give us the information. People were giving us information and then we realized later that that information wasn't true. This changed our lives. My My mom started recording her daily life after this. She would record when she would cook uh, meals, when she would do any daily things, when they would travel even. They were recording all of this on hope that when Muhammad Noor would be released, they would be able to share all of those moments that they missed. As ISIS started to leave the areas that they were in, um, we started to go with journalists to visit the prisons where ISIS was. And we tried to find any piece of information, any names. We went to the, the scenes that you were from the prison. Um, where I thought Muhammad Noor would have been. In Brussels, in uh, the summer of 2012, I was on a panel with Father Paolo. We were sitting together on the same panel, and now we're talking about him as a disappeared victim. So we, we were going to the prisons. And we went to all the places where ISIS fled from to find any kind of names or details on the walls or anywhere else. Collected tens of thousands of pieces of data, but I still haven't gotten one piece of information about my brother and the other people who are disappeared from my family, my cousins. There isn't a single family from Raqqa that doesn't have at least one missing person from their family because of ISIS.
يعني بنقول كثير امكانيات بسيطه ان ندور على ناس نحن بنحبهم اما بالسجون او بالمقاهي. We have very simple res- and, and basic resources available to us to try to find those that we love and care about. داعش يعني ممكن تصبر على بقاء هائله بقاء جغرافيه كثير كبيره. اخذتها ISIS had c- control over a very large geographic area. قوات النظام السوري، القوات العراقيه، قوات الجيش الحر التابعه وشبيكه ما بين المحتلين. فنحن عم نحكي عن خمس او ست دول هي فعلا او او ميليشيات او جماعات هي فعلا قدرت تسيطر على المناطق اللي كانت مسيطر عليها داعش فبالتالي السجون. And now the area that ISIS used to control is under the control of six different armies and militias. بس هي حسب البحث هي فعلا This has made it more difficult to get answers about what's going on. What happened when ISIS was there? And there is no attention and seriousness from the international community to get to the information. There are some teams that are working in investigating the mass graves, but it's very minimal compared to the need. The prisons that ISIS operated, many of them have been destroyed and have been uh, altered. No one is asking the former detainees and the leaders of ISIS who are now captured what happened to all of the people who were detained by ISIS. We always hear that uh, talk about the capabilities of the international community to work on this issue, but until now we haven't seen anything from the international community. They just fought ISIS as a military uh, force, but there there's been no interest in getting to the detainees. Many of those who are detained by ISIS are activists, journalists. They were the ones on the front lines of confronting ISIS. We have I hope that one day Father Paolo's family and all of the families will get information about what happened to their loved ones. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I think uh, we might open up to questions now. Just to clarify, I should have said put the questions in the Q&A function, not the chat. So apologies about that. And I'll pass the um, floor back to Rola. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Yasmin. Actually, we have um, um, some questions. So a few of them I can go to Noura because there is, uh, of course, there is a lot of thanks and warm words to everyone for being brave and sharing, and it's painful. Some of the audience already uh, mentioned that. So it's not uh, an easy topic to share online with a group of people, but it's, at the same time, it's very important because it's not only limit what's happening in Syria. Um, actually, there is a question to, uh, to Noura um, asking, um, what motivates Basel to first become involved with activism? So let's start with this to give some uh, more about the important work that Pasil used to do uh, in Syria while he was in Syria. 
Yeah, um, I read some of the messages actually and the questions. So I, I just want to start with thank you so much for your so warm words. Uh, uh, what motivated Basel to, to participate in this activism uh, in Syria is the same uh, uh, that motivated me and Amr and others. It's just love for our country and our people. Thank you, Noura. Um, th there's other question related to your work uh, with the Family for Freedoms. And uh, this two part of this, uh, there's two questions, but I can now categorize it in one question. Like what to tell more about uh, the, uh, the work you are doing for a while, I mean, with the uh, Family for Freedom. And also there's a question of, um, in relation to legal empowerment of family, uh, families of the missing. Yeah, so uh, I also read this question, but uh, like questions keep coming, so I just read some of them. Um, uh, uh, in our, in regarding to Families for Freedom, we are work on just advocating and networking uh, for the uh, for our like. Basically, we have basic four demands, which is the right to know. I mean, the right the families of missing persons to know their uh, their whereabouts and fate. Uh, the fair trial and uh, like uh, stop torture and ill treatment in detention centers uh, and uh, accountability and justice. In Nofoto Zone, we are uh, in some way we are providing uh, legal services for those who have detainees and, and for disappeared and missing persons. Uh, like we lead them how to report their their loved ones internationally and locally. Uh, we also we put them in contact with ICRC and ICMP and other kind like many uh, mission and delegation in the in the UN for example and also we empower those families to leave this this file and to fight for for their loved ones by uh, raising awareness and uh, like open the knowledge for them to know their their right the rights of detainees so everything related to human rights in general and women rights basically, but in like linked to, to, to them as families of detainees and the first disappeared. And also about like fair trial, the prisoners' rights, um, the exceptional courts, all this, because they need to, to understand and to realize all the context related to the detention in, in Syria. And we are uh, working on launching very soon a book about the legal framework of detention according to domestic laws in, in Syria. So this is what we work beside the advocacy about issues related to detention and uh, enforced disappearance as well. And you can watch our uh, social media and website as nofotozone.org. Thank you, uh, Nura. Actually, we have a lot of questions, so I will try to be fair, like picking questions for everyone. And also we can share as much as possible with this very short time. Um, there's a question, I think, Amir, you, you bring, uh, while you talk about the uh, actually responsibility of the international um, uh, society or uh, community uh, when they, for example, asking um, the ISIS fighter who, who sent back to there or have been kept, what happened to the detainees or the people who kidnapped. And there is a question, I mean, here we have to think that like, what's the responsibility or what, what's waiting from the international community in this regard? And second one, if there is any information about uh, where the prisoners are in Syria now and how many people are held there, where does the search for information about missing individuals begin? يعني بالنهاية في تقريبا في خمسة الأرقام عم تقول في خمسة ألف محتجز عن قصد. There are 15,000 detainees approximately who are held by the SDF. SDF are in the control of most of the areas that were formerly controlled by ISIS. Many countries, including the United States, UK, France, have the leverage to be able to force the SDF to investigate. None of these countries, not the international coalition, have 
produce a single statement announcing the results of any investigations that they've done. Maybe they've done some investigations, but they haven't told any of us. They haven't shared any information with us. There is no office handling communication. Many of the families believe that their loved ones are in, uh, those who took their loved ones are currently in SDF prisons or in Iraqi prisons. People are trying to get information. They can't even know uh, if if those who took their loved ones are which prison that they're in to go and get them. The same with regards to the investigation to mass graves in the city of Raqqa. There are at least five thousand people who are buried in mass graves. If I want to ask about my brother, for example, or about any other person, there is nowhere for me to go. There's roadblocks everywhere. There's no clarity at all on this file. Thank you. Thank you, Amir, uh, for elaborating on that. Um, actually, we have a question for you, Yasmin, and this is, uh, if you could you, uh, could you describe the process of filming? How did you get access to the different spaces and develop the relationships to the film? To film? Um, and also there is uh, another question, I think, uh, in several places in, in the uh, Q&A, if there, there's a change from the original plans and why? Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a huge change from the original plan because I was meant to be working on a film with Paolo, but it transformed over time. Um, and I actually very much like to use film as a process of research. So through meeting Noura, through meeting Amr, through meeting Paolo's family, it was filming itself that opened up the relationship and we built trust. And it was also my way of trying to understand the situation. So I was open to that over a long period of time. In terms of access to spaces, I mean, some of the footage is my old footage from Syria that I'd filmed. So I'd kind of done that in the past separate to this film. So I hadn't filmed it for this film, but I used it in this film. Um, all the other places we filmed kind of in the current times, uh, you know, we negotiated access with people and places. So I hope that kind of covers the, the question. Yes. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, there's a question actually uh, saying, uh, what is in your message to all the family who still did not report their missing uh, family members, how families can overcome their fears and raise their voices? I think this, whether Noura or Amir or both of you, you want to say something here? You want to answer Amir or I will get the answer? Please, Noura. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my message is that um, I know that like Syrian families are afraid that they, they have this idea that if they report some some detainee or missing persons, he will be like in difficult, more difficult situation and also the family. What I want to say is what left to lose? We, we almost lost everything and at least we have to like to, to document those people because we we have been in this conflict for almost 10 years now, and maybe we will still in, in, in like more 10 years later. So we are losing evidence. We are losing the, the uh, family's members. So at least those people have the rights on us that we should to document uh, their names and the facts of their disappearance and detention and uh, also to, to, to talk about them and then from from this like this step which is the responsibility of each 
individual family, the, the uh, main NGOs that I mentioned, ICRC and ICMP, will continue the, the tracing and searching the, those people. So please uh, just um, like encourage everyone to, to do this step because this is like the, at least the minimum thing that we can pro like, uh, uh, pro uh, provide to our loved ones. Thank you, Noura. Do you want to share something, Amir? Um, in this regard? I just want to reiterate what Noura said. When I was in prison, I used to feel like I was alone, isolated from the world and weak. What gave me strength was the thought that the people outside of prison were doing everything they could to try to get me out of this place. All of the effort and uh, advocacy for people in prison always leads to good results. It's a tragedy to find out that a person you're looking for is in a mass grave. But this is an important answer for a family. It's better than having constant questioning about what, where your loved one is. Thank you, Amir. I think we have a question because um, uh, disappeared and detainees, it's not only limited to, to Syria. And there's a question asking if, um, how, I mean, I think this is um, for everyone, if you can share some thought in this, how you uh, are taking an inspiration from other movements of disappeared in the world, for example, from Argentina, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo, if there is any learned lesson or there is connection or there is solidarity or if there is anything um, like to, to also taking from the other context, if, if happened. we are inspired and we are just following the steps of other people and societies did especially like Argentina, Bosnia for example and as families of freedom we went uh, to visit uh, with ICMP the memorial in Srebrenica and we are so inspired by their experience so like this is the situation of all the human beings so people just uh, got learned from other other people so uh, uh, for all these countries that I was grow up on their stories in Latin America, Africa, and Bosnia, and Eastern uh, of Europe, uh, you, you really did the great. So we we need your solidarity. We need your your support, even if just emotionally. Thanks, Nura. Actually, there's a question to you, Amir. Uh, I don't know if you would, someone asking if you can give more. Um, information about the experience in prison, if you feel comfortable to share some of uh, your experience. The prison I was in, it was in March 2012, in the Khatib branch in Damascus. It was my first experience being detained. It was a new experience for me. We had heard about the horrors in, I still to this day feel the fear and I have nightmares. The thing that I, and the thing that I'm most afraid of is going back to prison. You go from being a person with freedom and will and dreams and you become locked up and you become a different person. You're no longer human, you're just in a cage. There's beasts always harassing you and fighting you. And the first experience was 16 days. The ugliest 16 days of my life.
And after, and while I was in prison, I said, the second I'm released from here, I'm going to run away from Syria forever. But when I was released, I saw the tremendous solidarity from my friends and others. And that gave me some motivation to stay in Syria and to continue working. But then I was detained a second time, six months later. The second time I was detained for four months. But because I had a previous experience, it was easier for me, even though it was much longer. Even though physically I suffered a lot and my head split open and I had to wrap it. But I had hope. At that time I felt like I was stronger than the prison guards because I went in as a journalist. And we had, at the time we had dreams that maybe we would change our country. That's the most that I can say about my experiences. Thank you, Amir, for sharing. Um, uh, we still have some time for taking a few questions. Um, and uh, there is uh, a question after thanking all of you, Nora, Amir, and um, uh, Yasmin. There's a question asking if, um, about the current situation, does forced uh, disappearance are still happening on the large larger scale today in Syria? Any updates? Any? Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, while we are sitting, talking, and uh, discussing about this, for sure detention is committed every day, and disappearance and killing because of torture, and a summary execution is happening like maybe uh, like each each hour uh unfortunately uh everything is still happening and until now and uh at at least we need to stop uh, all these kind of violations immediately uh, maybe there is like some russian initiatives for releasing some prisoners or reveal their their fates but we we really want to like to, for for this kind of initiatives to spread over on all the Syrian uh, uh, on all Syrian places and uh, to, and with like to not exclude at the same time the the detainees and disappeared and kidnapped with the other parties especially with uh, with ISIS. Thank you, Nura. Uh, actually, there is a couple of questions asking how people, they can support what they can do, they want to do something, and it's a question coming, I mean, over and over. I don't know if you have any thoughts how, uh, because now we are actually on the time to, unfortunately, <laughs> the time flies, so we have to, to end um, within five minutes. So if there is a final note so from our panelists, um, if you like to consider to give some, uh, share some thoughts, ideas, how people they can be um, in a sol solidarity, support, and what they can do, what you can ask anyone to take a responsibility and to take a part for people who disappeared um, and kidnapped and missing. Can we start with you, Yasmin? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, for me as a filmmaker, I really hope that we can use the film as a way to bring people together, to create awareness for people to get deeper understandings about what forcible disappearance is, what it does to people, um, and its effects for the loved ones that are looking for answers. And I hope that the film, you know, if, if you've been touched by the talk today, if you've connected with the film, please tell more people about it in as many countries as possible. We want as many people to watch it so that this becomes this is part of the wave piece of the puzzle in making this an issue. Um, and I really hope that the film can be done and can be used in that way to, to, to put the pressure um, eventually to release the detainees and get answers about the disappeared. Thanks, Yasmin. Nora, final notes. Uh, yeah, for me, any kind of support is so important, actually. But keep, please keep talking about that. Detainees, missing persons, and enforced disappearance. 
kidnapped in, in Syria. Keep talking about all these families association and the uh, Syrian organization that work on this field. Uh, so spread the word about families for freedom and uh, no photo zone. And uh, if you don't mind, Rula, you can share my email with, uh, with the participants and attendees. Thank you, because there's also a few questions about how they can follow your work. So we will we'll try to share website. Also, I want to mention before going to Amr, please, the one who not yet watched the film, the film is available until the end of July. So Amr, please go. If you have to, if you want to share any thoughts, how people they can support, what they can do. يعني تمام مثل اللي قالت نورا كل ال كل كل الحكي عن قضية نورا سعد عشرات آلاف الموجودين بالحكومة اللي 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 فعلًا هم ما بيعرفوا نفير اليوم هو واحد من الأشياء اللي فعلًا ممكن تكون there are still tens of thousands of detainees in uh, Syrian detention today and we have no idea about their fates. Any conversation and advocacy for them, it helps lend moral support. Journalists and media need to continue to pressure uh, the government and the international community to provide answers about the former detainees who are under ISIS detention. There are tens of thousands of victims whose families we can help now to find answers about their missing loved ones. These same governments should be thinking about how to have fair uh, trials so that people can feel that there is some um, level of justice for Syria and for the world. Thanks a lot, everyone. I just want to make sure, Yasmin, uh, for people, because keep asking about where to watch the film, if, if you just want to share where, how, and I, I already mentioned till the end of July, but just also to repeat this to, to give people more information about this. Um, yeah, so there's two ways to watch the film. If you signed up for this webinar, Syria Campaign will give you a free link to the film and you just need to click through. Um, just keep clicking through and it will work for you. Um, uh, but for anybody else who's outside of this conversation and you'd like them to see the film, you can send them directly to the film's website, which is ayunifilm.com, um, and you can access the film there as well for Beyond July. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, Noura, and Amir. Um, uh, Kinan, thank you very much. And I wish everyone a uh, good time. Yasmin, you have something to share? Yes, I just uh, I thought I'd also share um, there was just uh, in the chat uh, a link to a letter for people to sign to protect Syrian detainees uh, in this time of COVID-19. So please just check it out uh, in the chat in case you haven't seen it. Thanks, Esme, for mentioning that. Thanks, everyone. And wish you everybody health, safety, and be well. Bye.